Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to, well, I've called this talk uh, Intimate Distances, and um, you can see that the circumstances of my encounter with Natasha was a very sort of, um, very much a sort of performance meeting between the two of us, very sort of um, under, under scrutiny in a certain manner. And I want to talk a bit about the circumstances of generating the project and then just elaborate a little um, on, on how that sort of impacts on some of my thinking and research over a longer period of time. Um, <clears throat> I've been making sort of interdisciplinary works for about 16 years now and um, they're very often a sort of merger between somewhere set between the visual, the sonic and the perform performative. Um, uh, lots of participatory works, filmed encounters, um, very often things where there's trying to be a, establish a balance between perception, event, and documentation in a kind of non-hierarchical manner. Uh, so not, not privileging, for example, the live event over its subsequent documentation, trying to kind of work out how one form can influence another and they can take, have a kind of parity across them. Um, in a sense, although the body is very central to my work, I don't really make works that are about the body as such, um, preferring rather to kind of hang ideas, if you like, on the body, using the body as a kind of channel through which um, circumstances can kind of become processed or flow through, if you like. Um, so the body, in a certain sense, is a place as much as a person, um, a foil or um, a counterpoint or a, a, a kind of point of orientation for, for other circumstances to reside in. Um, and I'm very interested in, in a sense, especially in terms of performance, um, in how this um, gives rise to a certain kind of set of transformations, uh, chemical transformations, biological transformations, psychological transformation within that given circumstance. Um, okay, Natasha is, um, by the way, what you can see here is the, um, the soundtrack for the film was generated on a theremin, which is the um, Russian non-contact musical instrument. It's the only non-contact musical instrument whereby um, the player plays waves in space simply by moving their hands around and um, you know they, they kind of intervene in the progress of that wave in space and so in a sense it's a kind of force field and actually the film when it's presented as a film in a cinema context um, incorporates a live theremin accompaniment so that there's a kind of film concert taking place and that's quite an important factor in its dissemination. Um, Natasha herself is an extraordinary um, character and um, it's worth knowing a little about her background. Um, she's a fourth year medical student at uh, Moscow University so she's, she's in the process of becoming a doctor. So in one sense, she represents the orthodoxy of you know, Western medicine. Um, but simultaneously, and since the age of 10, she's also felt herself to have this other sort of supplementary um, vision, second sight, um, perceptual vision, um, penetrative gaze, something like that. And, um, She's been, you know, this, this has persisted and it draws on another set of histories, if you like, and circumstances that are also very much to do with um, non-Western, um, um, perhaps Russian histories um, of m mystical engagement, ideas around faith and um, um, shamanic content, if you like. And um, so she represents 
a very kind of ambiguous... Um, she's almost the embodiment of a certain kind of ambiguity, if you like, where she's drawing on these two fields simultaneously. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a, a, a citation from um, a text that I commissioned um, that was written to accompany the film by um, a French psychoanalyst called Gerard Vajman. And the text is called The World of the Shadowless Person. The power of science produces a sort of reaction of subjects, an almost vital refusal to let ourselves be reduced to its algorithms. Philip Warnell's film about Natasha Demkina states that subjects cannot be comprehensively calculated. Um, and th this is one of the things that I find really fascinating about working with someone like Natasha, that she, in a certain sense, um, is irreconcilable. Um, you know, um, she's a controversial figure. Many people see her as a charlatan figure. She's been the subject of many television documentaries, laboratory testing. Um, but, but it's very, very difficult um, to verify, um, to find the truth, to find the um, evidence, if you like, for whether she can or can't um, do as she claims to. Um, for, the, for my own purposes, um, and it, it's quite important to point out, I arrived in Moscow very specifically with the agenda of generating this film work, but actually my encounter with Natasha was unrehearsed and took place in this gymnasium. And just prior to shooting the film, we were negotiating the terms of the contract, the do's and don'ts of what we could and couldn't do. And those circumstances within which the film was generated um, are, as it were, for me, embedded within the material itself. Um, and I think it's very important to consider how that agenda comes to bear on uh, a project. So, for example, um, ideas of negotiation, um, ideas of discrete forms of communication, as well as more overt ones. Um, the consideration of things like um, the shifting roles that take place within the film. So, for example, for myself, I was the director of this circumstance in the film. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was directing a crew, establishing the terms under which the material would be shot, etc., etc. But simultaneously, and it's important that it is simultaneously, I'm also the, the patient at Natasha's clinic at her diagnostic consultation. And Natasha herself, whilst being the subject of my film, is also the director of circumstances and was very, very clear about what we could, how we could and, could and couldn't proceed. And um, I think it's very, very important in terms of um, considering strategies of engagement in work in general terms to think about how you can build in these um, sort of, I don't know, sort of phase shifts um, and um, um, the, um, the, the necessity for um, what constitutes performance in some way. What will it be that will actually constitute the performance? Who, when, and how does a performance actually take place? Now, in this mediated performance, nothing really happens. And um, one of the um, points of attention in, in the work is that I'm interested in the scrutiny of the act of looking. Um, so looking and seeing as being already active, not things that happen prior to action, uh, not requiring a gesture, not requiring a kind of linguistic content to energize the circumstances considering much more the idea that Natasha's gaze is already a veritable act that can affect the conditions of the, the reality under which we were operating. <clears throat> okay. So in a certain sense, we, we undertake several kinds of journey. We've got the kind of medical journey of Natasha's scanning of my body, 
um, and her evaluation of the apparent sort of dynamic condition of my interior body. Um, but we've also got another kind of journey taking place, again simultaneously, and that seems to me to be a kind of metaphorical journey. The idea that we journey together through this sort of interior space, this rather evocative space, um, that through its meeting point between the science of scanning the body and the sort of incredulous um, unknown um, circumstance gives rise to a kind of uncanny encounter, um, an irreconcilable zone where we simply can't marry those two ideas, the certainties of science, bodies of knowledge, known facts, with this very sort of difficult um, encounter whereby we um, almost, um, as the uncanny does, it gives rise to sort of superstitions and beliefs that kind of belie um, the, the usual circumstances of the everyday. <clears throat> now in terms of things like the location for the work, that's also uh, significant for me. I chose a gymnasium because it's full of kind of zones and um, almost kind of sight lines, motifs that sort of are um, reminiscent of things like um, g gymnastics, anatomical training, um, things to do with um, um, organizing and developing the body's kind of attributes. Um, we also had some fortuitous circumstances, things like targets in the background providing sort of ideas of trajectory and sight lines for the camera to fall on that became very sort of significant in terms of how we actually shot the material. <clears throat> okay. Um, one, one of the research interests for me that sort of developed this work, and I'm going to show you a, um, a, another performance work that was actually part of the development of this piece. Oops. Um, is the idea that um, um, it's, it's a rather old idea that Plato came up with called extramission. And it was a theory that um, as well as the eye being something that receives the external world through light falling you know, in, into the, onto the retina and the brain kind of translating that. For a very long time, people believed that the eye actually used an eye beam that emanated, that um, came from within and um, went towards the world and could in some way kind of direct, um, you know, something external. Um, a kind of, almost like a kind of phantasmagoria of sorts where um, you can almost see things that emanate from within, like figments of the imagination, for example, or um, states of mind that are being externalized through this eye beam. And they, they also, some people believe, for example, Leonardo believed in the idea that certain spiders could kill just by looking at their prey. Um, now, I, I, I developed some ideas of my own around this sort of proposition and worked with um, this piece called Unseen Footage that in fact is a sort of modified projector that projects a, a miniaturized image onto a, a, a tiny sort of screen that I'm wearing on my left eye. And in fact, you, you can watch the material that's archival um, material in situ on the eye. and. Um, you can see that I'm sort of um, hooked into um, an apparatus to actually hold myself steady during the, um, the process of this happening for obvious reasons that the screen needs to stay in the appropriate place. Out of interest, the um, apparatus that I'm using is an exact replica of a, a Victorian posing stand that was used in the photographic studio um, around sort of 1860s, 1870s, 
to, to hold the subject still during an extended exposure time that could be up to around 30 seconds. And you would, you would have this hidden device that would simply keep you in place um, during that um, pose. But of course, such a thing does have kind of connotations of its own. Um, um, and, you know, in a certain sense, people have described the posing stand, for example, as um, generating a kind of another body, the body that it becomes this sort of posing body, almost a kind of stand-in for the real body during the circumstances of, of the pose and the exposure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> As well as um, the um, extra mission theory, the idea of the eye beam emanating from, from the body, there's also the idea of um, a, a kind of intramission theory that bodies and things in the world give off these kind of sheddings um, and, and these sort of layers that kind of are, are residual and sort of can be collected via a photographic or a film kind of light capture process. And this was Balzac's theory that um, um, these sheddings, as it were, are, are collectible and in some way correspond to the idea of a, a soul capture, some kind of essence of the moment being caught and, and um, recorded. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really quite fascinated by this idea, and in, in a sense, in terms of the materiality of working with film, this is a film project. Um, it was quite significant for me, the idea that, um, you know, that these, these sheddings are something that, um, in a certain sense, have got this sort of essential quality. Um, <clears throat> Yet the other thing that happens, of course, in the circumstances of these kind of shifting roles and power relations, I, I suppose, is that when there's ambiguity in relation to power, um, you get a kind of eroticization that takes place. Um, and um, the, the, the circumstance isn't necessarily traumatic, but as soon as that ambiguity creeps in, um, you, you get this kind of surplus um, that is, is sort of emergent and almost, you might say, contaminates the activity. It wasn't necessarily something that I was prepared for, but I think it's something that, it, again, is residual in terms of the actual material and how the circumstances are embedded within that. Okay. <clears throat> Taking that as a kind of point of departure, if you like, the film, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other pieces that I've been generating um, through time and, and talk just a little bit about, um, as well, about ideas around bodies and where the um, singular meets the social body, if you like, um, and how that can impact on the way, the manner in which, the, especially in my case, the performative manner in which you generate material. Um, I work with a center for the history of medicine at Warwick University and often access all sorts of medical archives and um, collections. And in a certain sense, I work with the artifacts in those collections and sort of mobilize them, um, re-energize them, um, re-evaluate them, um, consider their the, the different kinds of history that are sort of embedded within them and, and do some work with that. This particular photographic piece is um, based around um, um, an object that's called a baquet. It's the sole surviving baquet um, of Franz Mesmer, who we use the word mesmerism. It's a kind of pre-hypnotic idea. Um, and he developed all sorts of kind of social and group therapies that were connected to 
an invisible fluid that he believed um, um, connected all living matter in the universe. And he called this fluid animal magnetism. Um, and this bake was meant to balance and restore the animal magnetism of those who were involved in, a, in the kind of therapeutic process with it, using magnetized water. Um, and by hanging on to a kind of skeletal arm, there are eight protruding skeletal arms that emanate from the, um, the vat, um, it would involve you again in a rather sort of uncanny process of actually, they believed, self-diagnosis. And in fact, the, the, the bake was meant to provide a kind of transparency of the body, enabling you to um, the rather privileged view of, of looking, at, looking at and diagnosing your own um, conditions. Um, it's housed now in a museum in Lyon, and um, essentially my work was to... Um, I got seven people, um, each of whom in some way form, forms a kind of loosely... Uh, a loose sort of lineage to some of the ideas that Mesmer came up with. So, for example, the lady sitting at the front is um, an anaesthetist in a hospital, but she's also a hypnotist. Um, and, you know, a, um, Mesmer's ideas were discredited to a certain extent. He was seen as a charlatan and... Um, Essentially, the device doesn't, scientifically speaking, do anything at all. It's a placebo. Um, however, there is a kind of nagging con continuity there. He's credited with um, being involved in things that might have been the precursor to psychoanalysis. And also the, the link between the magnetic view of the body and its transparency through... Um, devices like MRI continue and of course they're still to a certain extent unknown but um, so there's this strange um, circumstance where Mesmer is seen as um, you know a quack um, but somehow his ideas are still pervasive they still keep re-emerging as it were and of course, uh, this has implications for the idea of bodies, which is what I sort of, in a sense, want to move on to. The idea of bodies and their transparency and the idea of a kind of intersubjectivity between bodies, the um, per pervasive influence of one form on another. Um, just to sort of digress slightly, no um, presentation of mine ever takes place without some reference to squid. Um, unfortunately, it seems to be the way. Um, but um, there's one squid in particular that is quite an extraordinary creature, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. It's the Hawaiian bobtail squid. Um, and this squid works symbiotically with another organism, to generate bioluminescent light for, for a rather extraordinary purpose. Um, I'm going to just read you my outline of, of exactly what it does so that I get it in a kind of coherent manner. Um, <clears throat> the Hawaiian bobtail squid is a living light projector that can emit a controllable flashlight beam from its belly. The beam is powered by glowing bacteria. These bacteria are, are selected, swallowed, and temporarily held captive within the squid's built-in light organ. Using its ink sac as an iris, it controls the intensity of the glow emitted, enabling it to brighten or dim the production of light. The projection serves a dual purpose, acting both as a visual aid in the search for food, so a beacon uh, searchlight for food, but also, and perhaps more interestingly, as an extraordinary stealth-enhancing device. Um, essentially, the squid uses the beam as it rises in the ocean in the evening. Um, it's, it gives a telltale shadow to predators. Um, and, but what it does is it kind of measures how much moonlight there is on, on any given occasion, and it projects out this beam to eradicate the traces of its own shadow. So essentially it uses the ingested bacteria to remove the, the traces of its own presence. 
and it seems to me that it's a rather wonderful example of how um, something symbiotic um, can lead towards uh, the, the transparent body and it's a kind of aesthetics of disappearance taking place in this sort of collusion between two completely separate organisms. The extraordinary thing is that these um, bacteria are, are not bioluminescent unless they're ingested by the squid. Okay, so this sort of interdependency between organisms and ideas of sharing um, um, an exchange between bodies, um, they're kind of, you know, these sort of elements um, bring, bring sort of, yeah, perhaps they're evocative of um, the military in certain senses. It makes you think about this idea of the, the searchlight that if you can see the enemy in some way, you can hope to destroy it. And it's a strategic use of light for seeking food or seeking the destruction of other bodies in some way. So, I mean, in a sense, the squid leads us to this idea of the shadowless person, um, the, the transparent subject, um, which essentially was born with um, the discovery of radiography in um, 1895. And, of course, the, the idea that we could sort of witness suddenly the cadaver with it that is within us gave rise to these ideas of the, the revealing of the death drive um, and the the seeing of our mortality while still alive, almost sort of demonstrating the kind of um, um, the, the frozen body in some way, the, the essential stillness of the, the body itself. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's rather fascinating to consider the kind of um, connections between film as a way of freezing movement and x-ray as a way of revealing the sort of stillness of our, um, you know, the, the drive within us. I want to talk a little bit more um, about ideas of drives being sort of independent of or involuntary things that are kind of contained within us but are not part of our subjectivity. Um, And perhaps also, um, whilst I talk about those drives, it, it starts to suggest propositions of things like the foreign body, um, you know, a, a kind of an external object or part or substance that um, is, is in a sense perhaps sort of ingested or assimilated in some way by the body, but um, has got an agenda that's rather separate to it. Um, and it has a sort of blind insistence of sorts, if you like. Um, I'm going to read you a little sort of citation about that. There's an absolute gap between the organic body and the mad eternal rhythm of drive to which its organs, partial objects, can be submitted. In this precise sense, drive can be said to be metaphysical, not in the sense of being beyond the domain of the physical, but in the sense of involving another materiality, beyond, or perhaps we might also say beneath, um, that located in our sort of spatio-temporal rea spatio reality. Um, from certain, certain kind of various sort of languages and ways of, and vocabularies, and vocabularies and ways of describing this could consider that in different manners, as it were. So, for example, the Lacanian perspective would consider it a kind of spiritual corporeality, which I really like this idea of, that in some way the body itself becomes sort of spectral, if you like. Um, and um, <clears throat> one might also extend that to discuss the sort of notion of um, 
the anonymity of bodies. So as well as losing their corporeality, they lose their subjectivity in favor of a certain kind of anonymity. Um, whilst we're intimate with our bodies, they essentially remain beyond our grasp um, and are elusive to each of us in many respects. They're our way of being present in the world to others. And in spite of my best efforts, my body maintains its own material logic. Uh, through which its mortality is revealed. Um, and of course, nothing is more intimate yet alien to us than our own mortality. Okay. Um, now, talking of the revealing of the cadaver within us, I've, I've done some work myself with ingesting micro cameras to um, chart the sort of fantastic voyage or journey through the body. Um, the, the camera that I worked with is a fairly recent invention that um, has got a built-in flash unit and takes about 70,000 photographs on this journey through you over, it's an untethered camera, it's essentially a pill. Um, and on, on the left there you can see an x-ray of me where um, the camera that's ingested is actually this. Um, and I, I developed this work, which was an experimental medical procedure at the time, as, as a public performance. Um, you can probably see better here yeah, that there's, there's a sort of software interface whereby you view the journey of the camera through the body. And in fact, I showed it with some pre-recorded material that was the entirety of that journey. The one thing that I'm quite... Um, um, specific about is that I don't really see the value so much of simply demonstrating um, a, a medical procedure. So I sort of intervened in the process. The piece itself was called guest plus host equals ghost. And I'm very interested in those sort of guest host relationships, if you like. Um, but I actually swallowed the title of the piece in letter form just prior to swallowing the camera. So as well as seeing the, um, the, the medical value of um, scrutinizing the, the body's gastrointestinal tract, you also witnessed a certain rather more sort of poetic um, disintegration or reorganization of the letter forms that constituted the title of the piece. Okay. Now, my, my current research project is um, a collaboration with a philosopher called Jean-Luc Nancy, um, who's written an awful lot about um, uh, the circumstances of human organ tra transplantation and procurement. And I want to talk a little bit about that. This, this image is um, an organ transporter. It's actually a Scandinavian transporter. From I, I photographed it. It's in a collection, in a medical collection in Copenhagen. Um, so it's the kind of Rolls-Royce of um, organ transporters. But of course, the, the transporter of an organ during its temporary period outside the body um, is, is the period when the organ continues with this kind of drive and this sort of functionality, um, extending beyond the life of its original host, but it lacks a body. It's an organ in search of a body. And what happens during that time? What, what is the materiality? of the um, progress um, and duration of, of the organ during that time. And I'm rather fascinated with this whole proposition and I'm, a, and I'm developing a film and a data screen work that um, sort of elaborates ideas on this. <clears throat> Um, the circumstances of organ, human organ procurement have some fascinating kind of connotations when considering death. Um, for example, one of the, the newest, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing Leslie Sharp's um, recent book called Strange Harvest, is about how um, organ procurement interferes with the circumstances of death and the time of death. 
Um, and there's this notion of thrice death that's now emerged. And I'm going to sort of outline the, this, this proposition that in fact people undergo three deaths. Um, so the first death is in the circumstances of an accident when someone is, um, you know, um, they, they die through some cardiac arrest or whatever, but of course are uh, resuscitated by the emergency services. So they undergo their first death at that point. But then in, in the hospital, a second death takes place when they're pronounced, as it were, brain dead. And um, a third death um, takes place after that with the actual switching off of the life support machine um, and the, the physical stopping of their you know, functionality, if you like, and the procurement of the organs themselves. And this kind of staggering of death is something that um, is a sort of technological byproduct in, in, in this particular instance. <clears throat> And there are other ideas about this sort of split between um, some of the things we might think of as being, you know, very, very everyday and just part of ourselves. I was thinking a little um, for this presentation about ideas of estrangement um, and how, in a certain sense, we, we like to feel sort of integrated in terms of what we're doing and considering and involved in all the time, but how there's actually a gap. And I've got a quote from Rilke that describes that rather nicely. Um, what happens is so far ahead of what we think, of our intentions, that we can never catch up with it and never really know the true appearance of things. This could be extended to our relationship to our own body as experience, for example, in puberty. The child's perception of its own changing bodily, body rapidly becomes that of experiencing it as an estranged foreign body, an unrecognizable entity, a mutilation even, a reason to despair of its former self, perhaps even an object to be abused or cut into. And this idea about how in a certain way we, we, we do become estranged from ourselves, we don't necessarily perceive ourselves as, as this sort of perfect kind of integral being is something that I think is rather fascinating. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, sorry? Yeah, I want to show one more image if I may and then I'll, I'll just wrap it up and then we can do that. <clears throat> um, this is my sort of image to encapsulate the, the, some of the ideas I've been trying to talk about. Um, it's actually an image I photographed last week from a teaching, uh, a, a medical teaching collection. It's not a public collection in London at the Gordon Museum. And it's a hairball. Um, it, it's something that um, gradually through time was someone was, through a kind of compulsion, was eating their own hair. And eventually um, it occupied the entire space of their stomach organ um, and it had to be surgically removed. But you can see it's got the kind of form of the stomach. So it's a kind of partial object, but it's a sort of pathological, sort of um, very strange, um, rather charged object. And I was really rather fascinated as well with how it's encapsulated in this plexiglass container and how, you know, the priorities that come with um, preservation, presentation, display, and the handling of such an object contrast with the thing itself. Okay. Um, as time's short, I'm going to leave it there and see if anyone's got any questions. My, oh, okay, so my question um, concerns the film and um, the fact that Natasha, in her interpretation through, through her visual abilities, 
focuses on medical conditions without dealing with feelings and emotions, and it's very clinical, and I'm wondering if there's been a transition in her work since her turn to medical school, or is this always what she was able to see or what she chose to, to mm. speak about? Well, the terms in which she describes what she sees has changed radically. It's much more sort of textbook, if you like. Um, but um, she talks um, rather a lot about seeing things that she simply doesn't know what they are. They're not medical conditions that are kind of known. And she also talks about, well, there's two other, two other elements to it, really. One is the um, knock-on effects of one pathology or condition or illness causing another that in a way, and she talks about that in a way that medical science would never, never do. So, for example, in my case, she talked about my having a, um, an inflammation in the top left of my jaw that was having a knock-on effect for... The, the condition of my GI tract and the sort of, you know, the, the system of my tract in a way that a doctor would actually never do. And she says that's because she's seeing a kind of dynamic circumstance. So she sees the movement of the bacteria from your mouth to your intestine? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And the other thing that's quite fascinating with Natasha is she, she does this um, thing of watching people take medicine and through the course of, let's say, an hour or so, evaluates the, um, the dispersal and the Im impact and the effects of that medicine and, and to, to see whether it's actually having some kind of desirable effect and if it's therefore appropriate, which is also quite a kind of, well, it's beyond technology and, and that's what's quite fascinating as well. Does anybody else have anything, um, comments or questions? We'll also have a more elaborate discussion with Lisa following her presentation as well. Um, no? Okay, so we'll... Yeah, very good. Thank okay. you, Philip. Thanks. That was wonderful. Lisa, do you need a few minutes? Do you want to... You ready? Yeah, excellent. Actually, while I, I have a minute, I can mention, um, following this, we're going to do another, uh, Lisa Cartwright will be presenting briefly, and then we're going to move to a more elaborate discussion with Philip, Lisa Cartwright, and Rachel Mayeri, who's also in the audience, might join us. And, um, there's also going to be a small reception after this, uh, just very simple reception out in the lounge area here. Um, and also, while you're enjoying the reception, you can peek over into the exhibition space in the Vermont Gallery. And wonderful Rebecca Mendez, who's in the audience, has gestation in there, as, as well as Sylvia Rigon, who's not present. So you can take a moment, either on your way out or during the reception or any point, to observe those works. Um, and then later from 7.30 to 9.30, there's also the short film screening series. So we'll be screening quite a few films. Um, Rachel Mayeri's films will be there. Uh, so, some really interesting and very diverse pieces. Um, most of them very short as well, so. Great. Okay, so I don't want to um, project right away. So while um, Lisa Cartwright's getting ready, I'm just going to take a minute to introduce her. Um, she's a professor of communication and science studies at the University of California in San Diego. She's very well published, um, soon to have a book coming out, um, Moral Specu. Um, oh, it has, actually. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. You have the second edition coming out of... Um, Okay, the expanded second edition of, of Practices of Looking, an introduction to visual culture co-written with Marita Sturkin. Great. And then um, you're also author of Screening the Body, Tracing Medicine's Visual Culture. So it's really wonderful, actually, I think, between you and Philip Warnell, you make a really nice duo. 
Testing one, two, testing, testing. Okay. Okay, that's good. Thank All right. Great, thank you. Is there some place I can let's stop? This this will do. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm um, going to pick up right where Philip left off. While he was talking, I was kind of looking up a few things. Um, I have to sort of stand differently because the spotlight is directly in my eyes. It's really painful. Um, okay, first of all, thank you to Victoria Vesna and Stephanie Adcock for including me in this discussion, and it's been delightful to see Philip's work. Um, so I pulled up a few things while he was speaking um, that might kind of resonate with some of his points rather than moving to re directly to my own presentation. This is the work of um, Richard Robb, who does uh, virtual uh, kind of work on virtual medicine. And this is part of his most recent work. It's a virtual colonoscopy, a 3D rendered image from a CAT scan. Um, so this kind of resonates interestingly with one of the images that Philip showed us. And um, I'm, I'm pulling this from the second edition of Practices of Looking, which is an introduction to visual culture that Marita Sturgeon and I wrote in 2001 um, that at the end of this month will be available in a second edition. Uh, Oxford uh, expanded it, so we rewrote the entire book and, and brought it up to date, made it bigger, and uh, they published it with 255 color images. So we're really excited about this. But this is Richard Robb's work as published in that book. And this is a virtual colonoscopy in which um, one of the aspects of this that interests us is the inclusion of the different um, figures within the colon. And I was thinking about, uh, as Philip was speaking, the idea of ingesting the title of your work. Here we have an image that includes superimposed in the uh, your upper right-hand corner of the frame as you're looking at it. You've got the uh, avatar, which positions your body in at the angle at which you are viewing the colon. On the other side, you have the, the little 3D rendering of the colon itself. And then at the bottom of that one frame, you've got the black and white um, CAT scan of a cross -se section of the colon that you're seeing. So this was just um, kind of providing a, a, a science image that corresponded interestingly with Philip's image. Um, other images that I was thinking about that resonate with his his, uh, some of his work in different areas. So this is from the cover of Moral Spectatorship, which is on voice and affect in the cinema, um, in the post-war 20th century cinema, having to do with um, children and voice and how voice is produced in children who don't speak. And this is a film frame from a film called Mandy, um, in which the little girl in the image is being taught by a very young Dorothy Allison, um, mid 20th century film star to speak and she the little girl is deaf and this is a this was a common practice in the oralist period of deaf instruction to use a balloon as the mediating object through which the child is brought to voice so um, the book centers around questions of bringing um, subjects who don't speak um, to voice using um, mediating uh, mediating forms that are not always material, but are also uh, psychological and having to do with the, the intersubjective production of affect. Um, another image which didn't make it into the book, but which came to mind was this one of a bunch of children who are deaf surrounding a piano. And uh, it's kind of an interesting image to put with the image of the theremin. And Philip's image of the theremin showed you someone who plays music um, without touching the instrument by interrupting the sound waves. Here we have children who can't hear the sound, but they can feel the sonic vibration in the wind instrument of the piano. And all of the children are um, participating in this musical exercise through the physical touch of sound. So it's kind of a, um, a companion image to the theremin. Okay, so I'm going to switch off the images just for a minute. Um, so I'm going to kind of whiz through what's really a, a longer project. Um, it's a chapter of a book that I'm writing on animation. Um, and I'm, I'm working through the history of animation um, to think through concepts of uh, life and movement in the cinema, 
um, but also to think through concepts of the neurologic body and questions of um, neurologic disability and the way that the cinema has been used both to diagnose and um, to figure ideas of life and um, uh, neural ideas of moving. So to animate is a verb that dates back to 1538. And the idea of animation is to fill with boldness or courage. It's taken from the Latin animatus, past participle of animare, to give breath. And so um, this idea of life as breath is something that um, I pursue in this uh, chapter of this book on animation and the neurologic body. And I look at the idea of breath um, in its figural form, to give breath to, to give courage, to bring the other subject to life. Um, I work this through the ideas of the French psychoanalyst André Green, who was a student of Lacan's, and he's very much the central subject of, of my book, Moral Spectatorship. Um, he spent his career working on the relationship between affect and representation, and um, he suggests in his uh, kind of lifelong body of work on affect that the affective process is the anticipation of a meeting between the subject's body and another body. So he understands affect to be not exactly an exchange between two subjects, but to be produced through the energy of anticipating an exchange or a meeting with another body. The body sought might be imaginary or might be present. I borrow Green's formula and build upon it, affect as the anticipation of a spectator's body meeting the body of another, to think through the relationship of the animated body in, in my book on animation, the animated body on screen, to the animator who brings that imaginary body to life. Um, the anticipation of this meeting of the subject's body with the body of the other is always rife with the tension that lies in anticipation. Um, OK, so I move through a number of different um, theoretical paradigms for thinking through this anticipation. And I talk about the moral and ethical aspects of intersubjective communication, which is, I think, very much what's demonstrated in, in Philip's work in the process between himself and Natasha. And I regard Natasha as somebody who, can't, uh, who has not um, managed to shield herself from the perceptions of that kind of of a certain level of intersubjective relationship, which I find really fascinating. Um, but in my work, I'm looking at uh, examples like the work of the animator Max Fleischer, who is credited with introducing the technique of rotoscoping in his series Out of the Inkwell, which began in 1914. And uh, he collaborated with his brother Dave um, in the mid-1910s. Um, to try and find a means of animation that would approximate the fluidity and complexity of live action footage. So animated figures remained kind of simple versions of live action form until rotoscoping, um, not because animators wanted to make simplified, uh, reduced uh, uh, bodily movement representations, but because of the time-consuming and laborious work that was required in drawing the hundreds of frames that would be required to represent mo movement fluidity. So Max devised a plan to use live action footage as a template from which he could trace drawings, allowing these drawings to achieve the effect of fluidity. And um, Fleischer used this for, for example, in Cab Calloway, in Gulliver's Travels, um, in Betty Boop cartoons. And the rotoscope created a kind of a guide for the animated drawing. Rotoscoping is a technique where the animation cell is created by making a tracing of a live action film frame and repeating a trace of each successive live action film frame to create an approximation of movement. So. Um, I am interested in the kind of laborious work of the animator in the pre-digital animation in which uh, the animation studio becomes a place for working in the dark. Um, and I take an account from an animator who worked in rooms that were completely dark except for the light coming out of the pr projector. The rotoscope artists, uh, explains one historian of rotoscoping, were at the mercy of the painters who would later fill in the rotoscoped outlines of live action figures and who could, with a few stray brush strokes, make the image suddenly jittery. 
So what interests me in this project and what brings us to the question of uh, the neural logic is the question of, of animated footage and the, uh, the desire for smoothness and fluidity of movement from frame to frame and the way that the filling in of the frames with color tended to introduce a possible going outside of the lines that would introduce a kind of jerkiness or shudder in the image. Um, so these confessions about the laborious task of rotos rotoscoping um, suggest that while rotoscoping produced the effect of smoothness, it also introduced a very interesting means of creating a jittery body, a body that moves outside of notions of normal physical movement. Um, so uh, I move from a discussion of the kind of um, uh, pathological movement and the interest during this period in pathological movement and its production by default in realist rotoscoping to the example of um, uh, Titanic. And uh, the Titanic, the recent Titanic, was uh, filmed in near uh, the waters of the North Atlantic uh, or reproduces the waters of the North Atlantic. And in Titanic, uh, one of the agendas was to bring to life the humidity of the breath emanating from the mouths of the characters. So James Cameron um, wanted what he described as breaths that act. So he used, I, I'm abbreviating kind of a longer description of this, but he used the rotoscoping technique, this kind of tracing technique uh, as it's evolved in the digital era to bring to life the breath of the actors. And what interests me in this move is the attempt to connect the feeling that exists between the actors at the tension point before many of them are to die, at the point at which some of them are going off into lifeboats. You begin to see the breath emanating from their mouths, the, the steam. And this is a connective tissue that surrounds and, can, and brings together the subjects that in, a, in a way that's very similar to the intersubjective uh, dialogue through the balloon that I showed you earlier. Um, okay, so I will, um, I have like two minutes left. Keep going, okay. So um, some of the other uh, material that I moved through is Bob Stab Sabiston's work. Is anybody familiar with Waking Life and A Scanner Darkly? Um, I actually examined a film that he did uh, later than these two using his um, rotoshop technique, which is a variation on rotoscoping. And he made a short prior to Waking Life and, and um, A Scanner Darkly in which he uses these techniques, he made a short called Snack and Drink in which uh, he uses this technique, and I'm going to show it um, briefly here. Okay. American Tale sent two with one six video cassettes with two episodes in each one, which that that features the gift and the case of the hiccups, the legend of mouse hollow and babysitting blues, the lost mother alone. That's what friends are for. The bill the cats and power the lonesome ranger, mail order mayhem and law and disorder, and finally a mouse known as Zorowitz and then Sophie's visit. You know, the, the mouse known as Zorowitz is Bible sign. How do you know about this? Because I saw him before. So what are you going to 7-Eleven for? I'm going to get a, a snack and drink. What do you get? Like, probably a double gulp and some candy. Like nerds. <laughs> I usually mix them all. What? I usually mix them all. All the different drinks? Yes, all the different like drinks. That? Yes, I like that. Even diet? Yes. 
Okay, so in Snack and Drink, uh, this 1999 three-minute short about an autistic boy who visits a 7-Eleven store, um, Ryan Power, the, the boy, uh, was filmed in live action and then the footage was rotoshopped. And he's represented in this kind of pulsing rotoshop footage in which the camera follows him on a talkative trip to the snore, store for a snack and drink. He describes to his companion American Tales on six video cassettes with two episodes on each one that feature the gift and a case of hiccups. And he itemizes features including a mouse named Zorowitz and Aunt Sophie's visits kind of randomly. The uh, tracking and recomposing of a performance that might be described as compulsively and rhythmically repetitive uses digital rotoscoping to subtly and not so subtly draw our attention and redraw our attention to elements such as the stripes of Ryan's shirts, making them vibrate, the pulsing of a row of nozzles at the drink fountain from which Ryan pours himself a suicide, uh, a mix of different flavors, as if playing a kind of keyboard. Even his teeth are rotoshop to vibrate. So a question I want to raise about Sabiston and Pelota's film, uh, Tommy Pelota was the co-producer, is to what degree is this an articulation of Ryan's imagined state of autism, uh, a representation of his ho cognitive rhythm, and to what extent is the film an expression of a particular spectatorial appropriation of so-called autistic cadence and rhythm as a means of expressing, uh, of, of expression distinctive of the process of animation as a physically embodied uh, process that is undergone by the animator in the process of producing a rotoshopped film. So to what extent is this an attempt at a kind of neurologic representation of autism? And to what extent is this a representation of a filmmaking process that comes through a history of rotoshopping that uh, harks back to rotoscoping, which is an attempt at representing motor aspects of neurologic normality. Okay, so this is about compulsive behavior, the compulsions of the filmmaker, the compulsions of the autistic boy enacted on film. I'm going to cut short my discussion by ending with uh, an, uh, a kind of anecdotal um, example while paused at a stop sign on a snowy day in upstate New York, I witnessed a performance that crystallized my thoughts about animation and compulsive bodily movement. Um, peering through my ice-covered windshield, I determined that the roadway before me was clear. I was about to take my foot off the brake and accelerate through the intersection when a man stepped in the walkway, his movement catching my eye just in the nick of time and causing my heart to race. I paused and waited, my foot jittery on the brake. He proceeded to cross the road, but then he abruptly stopped. Without turning toward me or otherwise acknowledging me, sitting there watching him through my wind windshield, he froze for a moment. The image of his body held me as if I were watching him on a movie screen. He slowly leaned his head forward, lifted his arms up at the same time, and with his elbows high in the air, and be, uh, he moved them upward and behind his back, bending his knees, making a full turn around and yelling, ha, in front of my windshield. This move was punctuated by a shout that I failed to catch because of my closed windows, the cold weather. He held that stance of startled confrontation for a moment, then abruptly dropped his arms to his side and pivoted to face me. Grinning from ear to ear, he looked me in the eye again, swung his shoulders forward, and strode off to complete his path across the road. Now, I recognize this man's performance for what it most likely was, a performance of a complex motor and vocal tick performed by someone with a cognitive disorder, a tick disorder, perhaps Tourette syndrome, perhaps just a simple tick disorder. And in the same way that words like nonlinear or non-narrative fail fully to capture the logic of forms that don't match the expectations of sequence, timing, and duration in films, we call linear films, we call narrative, this man's movements could hardly be described as simply or fully involuntary abnormal movements. They were not out of his control. The spontaneous animation of the human body is a compulsive performance, and in one such as this, it's always in part performative and expressive outside signification in any strict sense, but never fully outside expression and meaning. So what struck me that day in being caught by surprise with this man's animated performance is the degree to which disorders of movement, uh, such as 
those that derive from autism that we tend to think as being involuntary or being pathological are in fact scripted into expressive performances that run a continuum. And animation is a useful place to look to try and theorize questions of neurological pathology, not to uh, further categorize or classify pathological movement, but to find ways to rethink the boundaries of normalcy and what is and isn't constituted as expression when we open up expression to the realm of affect. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Anyone have any comments specifically for Lisa? But I think we can also just fill up if you want to. This light is. I know, yeah. Or maybe you just pull up the regular house lights and then. Oh, she was just saying the spotlight's a bit bright. And can we just bring up the house lights maybe? And, or whatever the light is over the podium, sorry. I know. And that was the first time I've ever had that experience of, of looking and realizing that you're all seeing me do this as if it's painful to look at you and it was. So I apologize for that kind of no, no, no. way of giving a talk. We we'll have to get people sun visors up there. <laughs> um, Actually, it doesn't, but let me give you this one. You can just can focus around. I mean, if you want to stand up there, oh, you okay. can. I, I can do this yes. and this. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Wow, I really enjoyed your talk, both of the talks. Um, and uh, let's see. So fascinated by how you're um, framing animation um, within this context. It's, it's really an original um, perspective. Um, you're, you were talking about affect and representation, and I loved how you were able to bridge um, the human and non-human, or the li what's alive and what's not alive, or um, you know, to be able to talk about the face as something like a screen, um, <laughs> which is a funny reversal of uh, what we usually think of as communication. I think our whole notion of communication probably originates with the body and with uh, facial expression and, and affect and, and then maybe voice after that. Um, and uh, gesture might be, physical gestures might kind of be included within that. Uh, but, but the way that you were talking, you, you actually seem to um, Make an equivalency between uh, the uh, how how maybe an animated character could also embody or become a, a vehicle for communication, um, which which was a really interesting illusion of of boundaries between what I think of as being you know alive and not alive, human or non-human, in a, in an interesting intersubjective way. So it seems to me that that's something that. Uh, Philip is also working with in a, in a really curious way as well that there's a sort of two-way um, relationship between the gaze uh, one that as input and one as output at the same time. So I'm curious if maybe in this very general way <clears throat> both of you might want to talk about the idea of the face or the body as a screen um, and if, if that's just a, a way to prompt you to, to both of you to think more to, to speak more about um, the relationship between uh, media, media art, and the physical body at this moment in which new technology has really uh, created an, a very bizarre interstitial world where the virtual and the uh, organic is really uh, blurred. Do you want to go first? Um, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, all I would say, uh, probably just to add to, to what you were saying there, really, is that um, the, the particularities of rotoscoping that fascinate me are, are the fact that, in a certain sense, they're a trace of the real. Um, they're drawn from the event itself, if you like. They're not, in a certain sense, in representation of that event. They're actually part of it, as it were. They're a con they represent, in that sense, a continuum from the, th the, the actual circumstances that took place. And I think that's really important. Um, 
Um, yeah, that's all I'd say for now. Um, very interested in the idea of the face and the relationship of the face to the screen, and I think it goes back in film theory to uh, the work of uh, Bela Belash and, and a number of people who, uh, George Simmel, um, and uh, one of the uh, problems of giving a 20-minute abbreviated talk when you're, um, I'm very interested in the psychoanalytic theories of representation that did not take into account affect, and then those we kind of passed over that do provide a means for talking about how um, media like the face on the screen and um, the face as screen to the interior can be theorized in a very material way that is consistent with the history of film theory so that we can still talk in very specific ways about how representation, the face, and then the, the, the physical expressive as, as, aspects of the face work. Um, I found interesting seeing Phillips, this may sound like a, a big kind of turn from that, but the hairball that you closed with, and I wondered, because we spoke earlier, I wondered how many people thought, why are we seeing a hairball? How does this fit into this presentation? But I was quite interested to see that because um, my in on the idea of people who compulsively pick and eat their hair, it's uh, trichotillomania. And it's a behavior that is one of the many possible behaviors of people with Tourette syndrome. Not too many people with Tourette syndrome, the percentages in the single digits, have trichotillomania and pull their hair and not any, an even smaller percentage eat the hair. But um, while it's frequently theorized as being a, a, a meaningless compulsion, it has signifying aspects to it as well that include the ingestion of it and the meaning of taking in your exterior appearance. And this is a really under-theorized aspect of um, a neurological disorder that is helpfully theorized through culture and representation. Um, so I know that in thinking about the face, you weren't asking about hairballs in people's stomachs, but um, I thought that might be a, an interesting. Can I just, uh, just as a supplement, it's, it's also fascinating to see the, um, yeah, the, the, the idea that you ingest your exterior self in some way, but then once ingested, it's also fascinating to see that kind of, as it were, re-revealed having taken on the form of some interior organ, which, which you, you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. So there's this strange cycle of, of appearance, if you like, and how that's constituted. Um, um, are, are there other people who'd like to join in here? Um, hmm. I had another, I had another um, kind of line of uh, inquiry, although that, that was maybe to just follow up on, on your thought there. Um, one, of the, one of the themes in your work seems to be, I'd be curious to hear you talk more about the sort of role of curiosity, curiosity cabinets of the sort, uh, maybe from the Renaissance, which was of course the moment in the history uh, in, I don't know, our, our history of civilization in which art and science are really kind of bonded together in, uh, in these collections, princely collections of, of wonderful things, whether they were artificial, natural, artistic, higher or low culture. Um, it's been obviously written quite a lot about at this point, and Damien Hirst has been someone who's, who's really kind of popularized that, that whole line of work. But, um, but I'd be curious what you know, might have inspired you from that particular chapter, uh, because I think, it, you, you know, you both, you also seem to talk about something like morbid curiosity <laughs> in, in maybe what you're, I don't know if that's exactly what you're interested in, but um, the way in which we look at the body, or we look at ourselves as objects and subjects at the same time, that we can be kind of both sort of uh, pathologize ourselves, seeing ourselves from a distance, a sort of through a medical gaze and discourse at the same time as one that's subjective and 
um, full of the context uh, in which we live as human subjects. So uh, there's a really interesting sort of bouncing and ricocheting back and forth between these, these different perspectives in your work. Uh, maybe you'd want to talk more about that. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, what I would say, really, I, I like the word curiosity very much, actually. And it's, you know, um, particularly as an artist, it seems to me that um, one of the privileges of the, the role or the, the circumstance is that you can... Um, you can sort of traverse disciplines and you can um, pick at things. And some, I was talking to someone the other day and they were d uh, discussing the idea that you can crack open a book without really absorbing the thing in its entirety. And, and, and that thing of kind of curiosity leading to noticing things and scrutinizing things and in a certain sense perhaps attending to the details of things over and above any kind of larger narratives, I think is also really rather interesting. Um, but, yeah, I, and, and the other thing is, of course, with things like Cabinet of Curiosities and so on and so forth, is that these collections make very sort of associative links between things, as well as the links that come through, let's say, the science of a given discipline. Um, I was thinking of Pitt Rivers, for example, uh, which is a marvellously um, um, eccentric collection of artefacts in Oxford, housed in Oxford. And, um, you know, one of the, you can open a drawer there and it's Pitt Rivers' collection of stones that look like ducks. You know, so you've got a drawer full of stones that look like ducks. And I mean, they're the kind of things that any, anyone might happen upon, but to actually collect them all up and make them a kind of body of evidence and, in a certain sense, um, a very sort of, um, as I say, an associative form of knowledge that isn't, um, that, that resists the usual way that knowledge is kind of accumulated is, is to me really fascinating. Um, so like visual association over and above any other sort of thing really. Um, and, and for myself, yeah, I just, um, you know, accessing such collections is, is a really good way of, I mean the hairball is a good example of that. Um, I mean you don't really get to handle such a thing and be, be in the presence of such an extraordinary object very easily. I mean, that's a non-public collection, but um, it's a remarkable collection. It's the Gordon Collection in London in terms of how it's housed, where the architecture of the space and each of these sort of balconies corresponds to a section of the body and is a kind of exploration of the circumstances of the body in any given you know, um, part of its anatomy. And, of course, that reveals an awful lot of potentiality in terms of how you might w work directly with it, reference from it, and kind of use it as a point of departure, or whatever, you know. So they're just, they're just really wonderful sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the collection itself is a, is a wonderful sort of proposition in that way. Uh, and I, yeah, I do certainly use it as often as possible, even if it's not explicitly used in the work. Just very confused by it. So it's actually a question about more to you, Lisa Cartwright. I, I have to use the microphone. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I came in late to the discussion, and my question is really uh, to Lisa Cartwright uh, because I missed some of your talk, and um, I'm very interested in the way that you're using affect. Um, I am uh, teaching a course, and we're doing a. a a section on affect, and I've been. It's also about disability, so I'm coming from that angle. I'm in the English department. And um, I was wondering about the way that you're using affect. It seemed I came in when you said you were using this notion of, of anticip the anticipation of a body meeting another. But then as you were continuing your, in your talk, it seemed like you were, and this is my question, you were associating affect with those nonlinear aspects of cinematic representation, like jitteriness, like rhythm. Um, and I was wondering if I was reading that incorrectly. Uh, so I guess I wanted to know about your kind of relating affect to the, I guess, the aesthetic rhythmic aspects that fell out of, I guess, linearity, and then how um, that related specifically to this 
work on autism that you're doing uh, around this notion of compulsion. Is compulsion the quantity that falls outside of linearity, agency, that kind of stuff? So I just wanted you to talk okay. about it I missed everything. Hi. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Okay, so I teach a course on disability, and I do work on documentary. And um, this is one of those uh, presentations where I had to give a 20-minute paper in which I tried to bring together material on affect that's careful in terms of working through psychoanalytic theories that were dealing with children with affective disorders that resulted from early childhood um, problems like being institutionalized and not getting physical care or that resulted from having sensory impairments that um, led to developmental differences in cognitive style and in affective expression. Um, but in that work, I try to be really careful not to label the conditions pathologies and try to steer away from the language that assumes that affective difference is necessarily pathological. I don't do work on autism. I use uh, Bob Sabiston's film. I do do work on Tourette syndrome. I'm in a Tourette syndrome family um, that can be traced back three generations. I have a child with Tourette syndrome. Everybody in my family has Tourette syndrome. The father of my children has Tourette syndrome all over his family. We are advocates, activists, and insiders to that community. We work on affect in that community. In working on affect and disability, I'm very interested as both a former English professor and now a communication professor in questions of affective um, differences in communication and how they unfold among people with neurological differences and how we can come to a way of addressing them that understands them as cultural differences without veering over into the let's be happy and see all differences as just style and culture um, without dealing with the realities of the emotional aspects of them. Um, in a longer version of this paper, I show a clip from a documentary that's being produced by Brian Goldfarb, who is a colleague of mine and also somebody from a Tourette syndrome family, in which uh, little cameras, documentary cameras, are given to people with Tourette syndrome, and they do interviews with family members, and then you end up with this footage in which you see the affective performance of a person with Tourette syndrome who is talking about the social impact of their affective disorder on others. Um, so I'm very, very interested in the specificity of it, in the question of disease versus identity, cultural difference, um, and in working against cultural suppositions that have to do with um, pathologizing and also fetishizing. Yeah, in, in talking about the cabinet of curiosity, you know, we run the risk always of, of reproducing the fetishization of uh, disorders and, and their material artifacts. And, and I try to be very, uh, very material about the histories of things in order not to do that. Does that? Can I do a follow-up? So then how was that related to your reading of the film, though? So was affect, okay, affective um, disorder, et cetera, et cetera, right, or different affective styles as a behavior. But then it seemed to me that you were also looking at kind of rhythm and vibration, and, and you were using animation to talk about that and not I guess I wanted to know the relationship of animation as you were using it and affect. Okay, um, in, in the book that I'm doing on animation, one of, one of the projects in that book, which I am just beginning now, um, has to do with trying to understand animation more broadly outside of the medium of film as a means of trying to look at the way that we understand um, bodily movement and the way that we make assumptions about what's normal and what's not. Um, my interest in, keep on gesturing to the screen of the film that's not there, my interest in Bob Sabiston's, in this particular film, is to pose the, the very um, concrete question about it as a documentary. To what extent did he use the live action, you know, direct footage of um, Ryan Power, the boy with autism, and then impose upon it an idea of a kind of autistic affect or an affective rhythm that might lend itself to uh, get us to think about autistic experience or where is your attention when you have 
uh, an autistic way of thinking, or is it about imposing something that is a little bit like difference on the film as an aesthetic? I'm not interested in what Bob Sabiston thought, but I'm interested in the film as a vehicle for talking about the representation of, of differences and disabilities um, and how we represent them, because we're so far past the realist documentary moment. It's, it seems like uh, worth asking both of you um, to expand more about your thoughts of, uh, about documentary itself, seems, since that seems to be a theme for both of you. I'm kind of curious, uh, uh, for Lisa maybe to talk more about the idea of animated documentary, which is, you know, you, you gave a really great um, example of a hybrid form, which kind of combines realism with uh, ver a very expressionistic um, type of representation. Uh, I guess the, you know, typical question is what is the, <laughs> what is the real, what is the truth in that scenario, but I think that maybe there's some, some more interesting ways of talking about documentary at this point. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about just the phenomenon of animated documentary, which, which seems to be kind of uh, resurgent form. Um, the, I, I know of several different experimental f filmmakers who are, who are doing, you know, using int audio interviews and then animating to voice or um, using the body in different ways that uh, tie down the image to something realistic or something physical and then uh, elaborating in other ways that, that are more uh, symbolic or in other ways. And then you're in, obviously, uh, Philip's work uh, is, is a real experiment in documentary. Maybe you could talk about that as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the film, in a certain sense, um, is, well, it's not a documentary. I'm very clear about it being, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the word documentary is that it's also a genre. And um, rather than using the genre of documentary as a kind of reference point from which I depart, it's rather the contrary with me, whereby, um, you know, I, I, my approach to making work um, is in a certain sense much more about how do you mediate performance. Um, and, and in one sense that's inherently documentary, but in another sense it's rather genre-less in terms of how it goes about its business, you know. So rather than taking elements from genres or, or whatever, I, I, I much prefer the idea that you, um, you don't work in reference to them explicitly, sort of thing. Um, so I would say that, but um, yeah, and perhaps no, that, that's it. You know, yeah. In watching Philip's film, I was reminded of Graham Weinbrenn's documentary called George, which is about a boy with autism. And I show it all the time in my disability studies class because for students who are not film students, it's a really accessible um, lesson about representation. Um, Graham Weinbrenn is a, a former experimental filmmaker. It's Graham with an E at the end, Weinbrenn. He's a former experimental filmmaker, very famous in the 80s, who then turned to digital. But in the interim period, um, he did some work with uh, a man named um, Harry Cor Henry Cora um, for HBO. And Henry Cora has a son with autism. And HBO wanted an autism documentary. So Graham decided to turn back 15 years to direct cinema and just turn the camera on George. And nothing happened. <laughs> no autism got performed, really. And the film went on, and the film went on. And you saw this really nice boy, George. And very rarely did you see moments of autism. So they showed the film to, uh, you know, to the delight of the directors to make the point that to represent something, you know, we don't, we're not all walking screens displaying our identities or our or conditions. And uh, HBO said, no, it's no good. And so they had, uh, they had a hard time with this film 
Um, but on another level, it also gets to the question of your film, Philip, because you show us Natasha, but there's not really much to see or to know. Um, it's, it's very uh, unclear what evidence we can gain from looking at Natasha. Yeah, yeah no, sure, sure. I mean, it, it's, it's about, well, I mean, I suppose in a sense, um, one of the key things in the film is that uh, the film is about something that's a sort of experience that is a kind of immaterial phenomena. It's just not there. It's, 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 it's and will remain unseen. You know, it's unseen per se. Um, so what all you can do, and I think it's why I was talking a lot about the circumstances of an encounter, because all you can do is deal with the kind of conditions in which something takes place. But of course the thing that is actually taking place is um, immaterial and may not even be taking place. So, you know, so what do you do in those circumstances? And of course there, what you do do is you emphasize certain things that are in, you know, um, the process of the making. You, you prioritize things. Um, so, for example, to make sure that, I mean, and it's a rather technical point, but it's quite interesting in a certain way because it's about sort of attention of the filmmaker, if you like. Um, for example, I worked in a space that um, uh, was a very large open space so that when we image Natasha, if I can describe it like that, um, we could have enough, enough distance between her and the surfaces that were in the background that we could actually use a kind of um, depth of focus to make sure that whilst we're sort of looking across her face and kind of emphasizing the sort of her face as a kind of territory, if you like, the background became a kind of, you know, um, a, a sort of blurred color field where you might, f you might consider the fact that there's a sort of flow of material but without an explicit form. Um, and I was very clear about that when I was making the film. I did a test shoot to, um, we, you know, we were very, very concerned about um, how we were dealing with distance and surface and uh, trajectory and so on and so forth. So in a certain sense, um, I became very involved in things that, that aren't the actuality of the thing that the film is about. And I, I really like that idea that in a certain sense you, because you can't make the film you want to make, you make another film that envelops it, you know. Um, and, and that seems to me to be rather a sort of summary of what, what, what it was about and somehow. Um, in the absence of the thing itself, what do you do? And for me, in a funny way, um, thinking about the sort of the, the, the real and the performance of the real, the real is always absent. There's the gap between the real and your explanation of it. And in that gap is the work. Um, you know. Oh, no, it's someone behind you there. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to introduce a different idea to this conversation. And I was thinking of these um, practices that have developed in the cities during the recent years where we see groups of people jumping on roofs or doing like this, this sport. It's called jump, I think. And I was wondering if we could relate these to animation and these ideas of the body that it's called jump and groups of people um, collect together and they are trying to develop alternative patterns of moving the city and they jump on roofs or I don't know, they do some crazy things really. They dance. originated in France um, and a, a friend of mine was involved in one of the sort of, and it's very choreographic, 
kind of, um, and it's very much around the sort of, it's very disciplined, um, training and falling to kind of um, make progress, uh, uh, traverse the city, but w without the kind of impact of its corners and edges on it. Have you, have you not come across it? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you want to say something. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that practice, but one of the issues that I'm trying to work out for this book on animation is the question between the aesthetic reproduction of movement and the idea that certain movements are beautiful and that other movements are not, and that some movements are simply ugly and that other movements are uh, derived from some sort of pathology. You know, we, we have certain general ideas in different cultures about those things and where do they come from and where do they break down. Um, so just to throw in some sort of assorted thoughts on that, um, there's a, a Dutch scholar who works on dance who, um, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, Mika somebody, and she does psychoanalytic study, it's not Mika Ball, psychoanalytic study of, of performance and movement. And she told me that there's a Dutch study that shows that um, spontaneous movement in dance is more stereotyped than scripted movement. I, I did, that just stuck with me for years now, and I, I should get her name so I can cite her and I should get the source for it. But it seems significant to me to think about the, the fluidity of, of spontaneous movement, that it comes from ideas that we have about what's spontaneous and what's beautiful. Um, and I'm also interested in um, the, the kind of self-censoring that goes on in the performance of, of routine gesture and, and movement um, to steer away from ideas of, of pathology and difference in dance. But I don't know this jump routine. I would definitely look for it, yeah. Um, the Tourette Syndrome project that Brian Goldfarb is working on that I would have concluded with but didn't have time to show involves um, performance studies scholars in, in Buenos Aires who uh, worked with kids with Tourette syndrome and had those kids teach them their tics. And then there's a lot of video of, of these performers who are theater performers trying to get them right. And then the kids tell them, no, you've got to do it a little this way, a little that way. So. <laughs> it's very interesting, this, uh, this kind of the way things have collided here. Uh, just looking at your two style, that you're both kind of looking at film in an interesting way to explore some other thoughts. And that within that, um, there's also this film screening, which I wasn't, uh, you know, really thinking about that at the time when I lined it all up. And actually, Alex O'Flynn, he was, yeah. do you know about his work? I hope you, yeah, it's unfortunate it's last. <laughs> but it's really interesting. It's so fabulous. It's so what you're talking about, and it's so refreshing because this is a student who's had Tourette's and who's dealt with the tick all of his life. And in this film, he, it's just, I don't even want to spoil it, but it's just, it's very, um, it's very elegantly done and it's very simple. Um, but it's just beautiful the way that the people in his life have never talked about it. And this is a documentary. I mean, this is him sitting there deciding, you know what, I've, I've gone away to college and I've realized I have this thing. And it's so, it's so, it's very fast. It's just really beautiful. It's really touching and, and I think very well done and very simple. It, it's really interesting. And on top of that, what you were also talking about in terms of movement and how, you know, about spontaneity and movement and these, these ideas of, of what beauty is, you know, in movement. Um, I often think some of, you know, Buto is a great thing to think about as well. Um, there's a lot of movement in Buto that is considered beautiful, but maybe to certain predisposed cultures or certain ideas, you know, about, you know, that, you know, a, a long, flowing, graceful line, that's, that's beautiful, but anything interrupted isn't. Uh, but I think some people believe that, that beauty is more than appearance, it's also about truth, uh, you know. That sounds really philosophical, but you know there is, and I, I think there's something really beautiful. I mean, it, that comes through in Alex O'Flynn's film really nicely, uh, and and you know and that idea too that um, I don't know. This is just something I've been thinking about as well, um, and I was thinking about Buto when you said that. It just came to my mind. Yeah, um, I, I hear what you're saying about the beauty of theoretic performance, but I'm trying really hard in 
at least in my own efforts uh, to work on a disorder such as Tourette, um, to move away from the idea that it's another form of, an, it's, it's, it's an aesthetic or that it's another form that we might learn to see as beautiful, and to move toward the idea that there are aspects of expression and order there and meaning there at the affective level that we might come to understand as, as being um, communicative as opposed to kind of erasing the differences that we see and looking for the normalcy. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm leery of aesthetizing. Um, so. I think, this, you know, I think it's really just about not looking at it that way. Just not, you know, when Alex came to me the first time actually to drop off his film, um, I could tell he was very nervous and he was moving a lot. And, you know, I just, I just, it was like, you know, that didn't bother me. I didn't think anything of it. I, I, I thought, you want to come in and sit down. You know, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I could tell he was nervous because he was coming to me and he was giving me his film and he was asking me questions. And then I saw him later in the court um, talking to his friends and he was, and it's just, it's really so interesting. And I think a lot of it is, um, uh, it's, you know, it's such a slippery slope. How do you talk about this stuff? You know, you can talk about it all you want, but until you've lived it or you've been around it, you have a very different relationship to it. Um, and it's, it, anyway, it's such a great conversation, though. Wow, we've got it going around the room here. It started off so, you know, academic and now it's like, okay. Anyone else? Do you guys know? I think, absolutely. It just, um, seems worth kind of saying, maybe in conclusion, I don't know, but um, to think about film from the perspectives of science and art, which is the framework, I think, <laughs> more or less of, of uh, art and science, uh, I don't know what art and science center's framework is exactly, but let's just say, let's look, <laughs> looking at film from the perspectives of art and science, you have very different agendas going on, and, um, and I think that, uh, you know, Lisa's work is is so interesting in um, that it, it, for instance, her, her previous book, on Screening the Body, was was so much um, interested in, if I can phrase this well, uh, you know, the use of film to to diagnose or even to reify uh, pathology, um, the to use a, a visual medium to to try to define what some of the patterns that. Um, you find in, in human behavior and movement and, um, I don't know, morphology uh, might be used at the, by, with a different agenda by an artist um, to, to address aesthetic um, questions or explorations. So it's this uh, middle ground, um, you know, between, between using the visual medium to, to kind of assert a truth or to to tell a story about um, the body from a medical perspective um, that at the same time could be used to, to entertain questions about aesthetics, philosophy, whatever, which, which I find really interesting. Do, do you have anything to say? Um, no, not at all. Um, I think it's just fabulous when people who are doing artwork take on questions of science and medicine. Um, I think that when I wrote Screening the Body, it was the early 1990s and there was a, a very strong movement of, of critical theory being applied to science studies and representation in science. And I think we're at a very different historical moment when um, there is less of a powerful place for critical theory as it was done through the kind of um, critical undoing of science and there's a lot of interesting work that has been produced by artists that helped to move this along. Um, Philip's work engages at this level. I think, for example, some of the work from the 1990s did this sort of thing like Michael Jew's installations. Uh, Michael Jew is a, a sculptor. His last name is J-O-O. And for example, he had a piece in which um, he arranged uh, uh, bottles of urine on the wall that were uh, about racial designation through the analysis of bodily substances. Um, so it's about interpreting 
the representation of the body in science, but foregrounding uh, the history of racialized representation. People found all sorts of ways to do that in the arts before people um, began to take up these, these um, different way, routes to critique, I think, so it's great. Uh, to, to look at the artwork rather than just to criticize the everyday science. No, no, no. Oh, great. Well, I just want to thank both of you so much for coming out and participating. Thank you very much. It was really, really engaging. And there'll be, um, food should be arriving shortly. Um, and we can convene. Oh, that could be it. So, yeah. <laughs> And then please enjoy the gallery exhibitions and meander, and then at 7.30. Maybe we'll, st well, I guess we should wait. So, nevertheless. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.